Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Seriously Risky Business, the podcast we do here at Risky Business Media HQ, uh, where we talk to Tom Uren about the newsletter that he writes for us, which is called Seriously Risky Business. And you can find it at news.risky.biz if you wish to subscribe, and I recommend you do because it is a terrific newsletter. Tom's work with us is supported by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and uh, we also work with Lawfare on this one, Lawfare Media. So big thanks to uh, all of them. And uh, also we have a sponsor this week uh, for Seriously Risky Business, and that's Corelight, which of course makes the Zeek uh, Network Security Sensor. Uh, sensor. Wow, that was a hell of a pronunciation there. Sensor. <laughs> and, um, you know, Corelight uh, and Zeek, it's the industry standard really for turning network traffic, crunching it and getting the security relevant information out of it and throwing it into seams, NDR platforms, whatever. Uh, if you don't know Corelight, you absolutely should. Uh, but anyway, Tom, let's talk about what you've written uh, this week. You've covered a few things this week, all very interesting, but I want to start off by talking about this US government proposal to introduce a sort of backstop for cyber insurance. The reason I want to talk to you about it is I, I started to look at this when I was preparing the the main podcast with, with Adam and I was just like, eh, too hard. Uh, I'll ask Tom uh, what he thinks about this and, and to do some <laughs> research on this. And really what you found is that it looks like to a degree what the US government is trying to do here doesn't really quite make sense. That's my take on it. So the stepping back, the big picture is people have thought that insurance is a way to improve cybersecurity because you give companies a monetary incentive to improve. So that, you know, if like, you know, the idea is that if they're, they're ticking off certain security boxes, their premiums will be less. So there's yeah, a so like I, economic I've... incentive. Yeah, I interviewed a CISO from an insurance, like one of the big global insurance companies once, and they were like, yeah, you know, so we might say to them, well, you need MFA here or your premium is just going to be like insane. And and it works, right? So, I mean, so far, so normal. Yep. And um, every now and then there becomes a problem in an insurance market where people can't get insurance and the government needs to step in. And one example of that is after the September 11 attacks, the insurance for terrorism became prohibitively expensive and insurers basically wouldn't cover it. And in that case, economic activity ground to a halt in the States. So people were not building things because they couldn't get that insurance. And so there, the government at that point stepped in. Uh, there was a Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, I think it was called, and they provided what's called a backstop. Now, in the cyber insurance market, What's well, hang happened... on, hang on. Just before you go on, what exactly is a backstop? I mean, you know, the, we're, the... we're a cybersecurity podcast. Not everybody's an insurance expert. It probably makes sense to explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea would be that in the terrorism case, uh, it's not feasible really for private insurers to insure against terrorism acts like 9-11 because they're just so horrendously expensive. Uh, and so the government said, okay, we'll step in and we'll provide that insurance coverage. So everyone, uh, I'll use the word magically, it's not magic of course, has terrorism coverage that's provided by the government. Right, so they'll just underwrite that. risks that the private sector insurers won't, I guess, yep. and it's automatic and applies to everyone and that means the insurance companies aren't scared to give like comprehensive policies to people because there's a terrorism yeah. risk. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the vague idea. I'm sure some of the details are wrong, but yeah. In, oh, we're going to get, get shouted at by insurance people for sure. But anyway, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, move on. So what's happened in the insurance market is that insurers are gradually adding more exclusions for pretty serious events like uh, war. Um, and so the concern is that if there is a catastrophic cyber war, uh, people will be left without insurance and will be in a world of hurt. Now, so you get different views on this. So one of the people I spoke to, Daniel Woods, he said basically there's no justification for a cyber backstop because economic activity is still going on. So people are still operating online. They're still using the internet. It's not as if Amazon or anyone is saying we're not going to have an online presence because of the risk of cyber war. Uh, yeah, so there's no economic justification. This, 
I think we need to fold this company because we can't get, uh, you know, cyber insurance against black swan risk. Like, I get it. You know, in the, right. in the 9-11 case, yeah, when construction activity stops, like, obviously it makes sense to try to do something about that. But, yeah, the point that he made, and should point out he's a cyber risk and insurance researcher at the University of Edinburgh. <laughs> That's right. You know, yeah. this is someone who knows what they're talking about. He's like, well, you know, come on. It's not like... It's not like internet innovation has ground to a halt. So I think that's a good point. That's point number one. Yep. Now, another person I spoke to, Josephine Wolf, uh, her argument is that there's these gaps that exist. Um, they're getting, perhaps they're getting larger. And so the way to tackle that is perhaps you use the backstop as a way to improve security. And you say, okay, insurers, if you want a backstop, Okay, but in return, you've got to impose these security uh, measures. Your policyholders must do these things. Um, now, the, the problem with that is it's quite tricky because what are those things you would do that you would get people to do that, are, that actually make a significant difference? And so my thinking on this is that if there's no economic driver, the main reason you would do this is as a, is as a lever to improve security just generally across the economy, across companies well, uh, that are buying this, insurance. And this is funny. So I should also point out too, Josephine Wolf, the person you're speaking about, she actually wrote a book on cyber security insurance, right? Which is amazing. I did not know that people regularly wrote books about this just as a, as a single topic. Um, and, and both Jos uh, Wolf <clears throat> and Woods, they've actually collaborated on a number of papers. So they know each other. So they're like this yeah. nexus of insurance who, who happen to a, have a slightly... Click differing views on this issue. So it's, it, I found it, the whole thing very fascinating. Um, but I mean, so I, what I was just, <clears throat> sorry, what I was just going to get at there though, is that, you know, if the goal here is to actually introduce a backstop that you can use to get insurers to change their policies such that companies and I'm guessing government departments and all sorts of things start to improve their security this is almost like a sneaky way of introducing i mean something that kind of functions like a regulation that isn't a regulation which i think so if this is the goal this is a really clever manipulation by whoever in the u.s government is cooking it up when what we're saying is there's not really a practical requirement or need for it but it is a way for the government to kind of move the needle on you know, forcing people to adopt better security controls. So if that's the part that I find interesting about this, which is maybe that's what they're trying to do. If that's what they're trying to do, I think that is potentially a great idea. <laughs> so I'm that's, not that's 100% the most convinced. Tom Uren, that's the most Tom Uren statement of Tom Uren statements, which is if that's what they're trying to do, I think it's possibly maybe a good idea, yes. That's right. And the reason it's caveated is like, I, I guess the first question is what would you get them to do? And so interestingly, uh, Daniel Woods has actually done research on what security measures actually make sense. And it's not, uh, and like vastly paraphrasing, it's there is no single checkbox or series of checkboxes. It's a lot of it is about how you implement things. Um, and so a company can have MFA and another company can have MFA. And it really comes down to the difference between the two can have different um, you know, end state security postures based on how well they implement it and all the sort of stuff around it. It's not just the, the checkbox. And well, so, this is why I've always rolled my eyes at companies like Security Scorecard because the idea that you can just get, <clears throat> excuse me, some sort of uniform risk measurement without having, you know, so much context on individual environments. You know, it's always been, in my mind, a fundamental problem with the way a lot of this insurance stuff uh, operates. That said, I think things like, you know, universal MFA, there are certain things uh, that, that certainly help and certain things yep. that are indicative of a better security posture. The type of company that has MFA applied to all of its users is also the type of company that's capable of doing that. And, you know, that tends to, tends to suggest certain things. But I, I take what you're saying and I, I agree with you, which is that there's not really a way to accurately and uniformly and easily measure risk across different companies when risk is so context dependent. Yeah. And so when it comes to trying to raise the bar, I think it, to me it is, is a, a genuine question. Is this the best way to raise the bar? And if it is, I think, yeah, go for it. Uh, now, 
Josephine Wolf described doing this as tricky because there's so many different issues that you're trying to, I guess, uh, weigh up against each other and, and trade off. And so the, the question this left me with is, is, is this the best bang for buck way to improve security? Or is there a more direct way to improve security? Now, if you're talking about some of the bigger risks in this category, it's uh, critical infrastructure, um, is there a more direct way to try and encourage them to improve security? And I guess perhaps in the context of the US, there isn't in that there's been this back and forth about whether, for example, the EPA can uh, impose cybersecurity regulations on water and wastewater facilities. Well, I think, I think we've already... I think we've already learned the lesson that they can't. They can't yeah. enforce that, but they can issue guidelines and, and whatnot. But also, you know, you and I have spoken previously about how an advantage uh, to the government in the Chinese system is they can just tell people what to do. But I think anyone who's taken a poke around the Chinese internet would tell you that it's not, you know, that hasn't necessarily lifted the bar um, all that <laughs> much right. over there yeah. just yeah. yet. And maybe in time it will, but, you know, that's sort of a fundamental question about, like, you know, even if you had unlimited regulatory power, is that something that would even help when you've got a limited workforce and expensive controls and, and whatever? And then we get into a whole philosophical discussion. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, I guess I, I came down on the sense that this felt like a tricky issue where it would be hard to get traction and therefore the government should do something else, basically. And yeah. if you had unlimited government capacity to do all sorts of things, yeah, sure, go for it. This seems like an additional tool that would be helpful. But uh, I doubt that it's the number one tool. Like if you've got the list of the most bang for the buck measures you could take, is this number one? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's further down the list because it's tricky. Um, and. It, I think we're still in an era where there's easier things to do. Yeah. I mean, they are doing some of those things, right? But I, I certainly take your point. Now, look, let's move on to another thing that you covered. Uh, we touched on this in the weekly show yesterday, which is this um, Iran hack and leak targeting the Trump campaign. Of course, they stole a bunch of documents uh, and have been leaking them to the media. What's interesting about this is the media in the United States hasn't taken the bait. And... I really, really enjoyed reading what you've written about this because it's a point that I intended to touch on yesterday and didn't. One of the, the, the big differences between now and 2016 is that in 2016, you know, a leak of stolen material had such novelty that people were writing these pointless stories about like internal DNC politics that really, I mean, weren't even that much in the public interest. It's just that it was an insight that came through stolen documents and everyone was writing about it and it sort of gummed up the press cycle. Whereas now, publications have kind of come out and said, yeah, here's what was leaked to us, these documents. We're not really going to report on them, you know, case closed and the news cycle moves onwards. And the point you made, which is, again, is one that I intended to make yesterday, is that if we've <clears throat> raised the threshold at which publications will deem something newsworthy when it's in a in, in a stolen archive, like that's a win. So of course, if 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 they receive leaked material that's full of evidence of like felonies or whatever or some really explosive stuff, they're probably still going to report on it. But what they're not going to do is let this turn into a massive distraction during an election campaign, and that is something to feel good about. Yeah, I think there's. That's definitely a win. There's also, you look around, and for example, Christopher Bing. Um, so he's a cybersecurity reporter. And he's, you know, just on Twitter, he said, you know, here are the things that you could do to kind of verify these documents. And he's got a little list of things. And so I think the reporters, uh, not every reporter, but there are reporters who are much more savvy about how you would actually go about checking the veracity and things you could do to to. Uh, verify things technically. So that's also a win. I, I agree with you totally, though, that if it was full of felonies, um, it would absolutely get reported. One of the articles I looked at was the Washington Post's media reporter, and he went around to different media organizations and asked them about their decision not to just republish or, I guess, mine the documents. And it was clear from all the quotes he got that every single one of them had thought, what's the balance here? What's, is this 
document newsworthy or is it the hack that's newsworthy? And most of them were like, yeah, we looked at the documents. Uh, we thought about it. We made a deliberate decision. The, the, that they were hacked changes our thresholds. And so I thought that was a really, <laughs> and even just the presence of that piece, you know, here's the media introspectively examining itself <laughs> about this hack. Uh, I thought it was an interesting reflection on how things have changed. Well, we in the media love to give people insight into what we're thinking because often we believe that's the most important thing. Um, do you wonder, though, if this were, you know, if these were stolen documents from like the DNC again? I think one of the differences, though, like it's the fever dream, like fever swamp right wing media that would go ape with this stuff. Do you know what I mean? So I, I do wonder if one of the reasons this is being treated a bit more responsibly is because, you know, Newsmax, Fox News, those sorts of outlets aren't really, you know, this stuff is damaging to their guy, uh, would be damaging to their guy if they were to focus on it. Whereas, um, you know, in this case, it's like outlets, like you said, like Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, whatever, you know, they're the ones looking at it and saying, no, no, we should be responsible here. I, I just wonder how much of this how much of the win here is just because of which side of politics it happened to affect. You know what I mean? I think which one of the things that makes I me feel quite, a bit icky, but yeah. Yeah. One of the things I found quite hypocritical was the Trump campaign's statements about the material. Um, oh, you this know, is outrageous. This is, this is how this, dare out, someone yeah. do a hack and leak, right? And they're out here trying to destroy democracy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's contrasted with what Trump did in 2016, which he basically said, you know, Russians, if you're out there, go and hack away at Hillary's yeah. email. Um, I mean, you can imagine Harris coming out and saying, Iran, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the fact that that seems so ridiculous is 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 sort of a sign that we've moved on. But look, uh, that was all, all very interesting as well. Now, another thing that we covered on the show yesterday, but you've got more detail here, uh, is this uh, court ruling in the United States that has found that geofence warrants might be, in fact, unconstitutional on, on Fourth Amendment grounds, uh, which, you know, I've, is is very, very interesting and all of that. But I remember seeing that there was people thought that this was a nuclear take um, from the judge, but I, I couldn't remember why. And you've gone and found a, uh, I think it's a post, a blog post from Oren Kerr, who is a professor of law at UC Berkeley. And you've quoted from that blog post. And basically what he's saying is that this decision could be interpreted to, to basically, uh, uh, this decision could basically mean that any database search, not just a geofence, could be considered unconstitutional because the, the process of searching through a database means that you know, people's records are examined who might not yeah. be, you know, the targets of the search, which is very interesting. So, you know, you wouldn't expect if that's going to be the prevailing interpretation of the ruling, you wouldn't expect it to hold, right? Yeah, no, it actually conflicts with other previous rulings as well. But the um, Kerr says the reasoning in the judgment is that when you're searching a large database, and it has to be large, but we don't know how, how large, because you're examining the records of all the individuals in the database, that's an unconstitutional search, even if you're just searching for particular, you know, very specific uh, records, you know, that you can uniquely identify. And so that means that it applies not just to geofences, but anything that's a database query. So, um, you know, cell site location information, uh, keyword searches, like everything is a database nowadays. So that would be, I think, very, very problematic if that was found to be right. Now, in terms of smartphones, because when you think of geofencing, my first thought is about smartphones. That is probably a moot question because these geofences used to work on Android devices because Google kept location data centrally. Um, but they've moved away from that. So now location data is kept on devices. Um, I'm pretty sure Google just wanted to get out of the business of satisfying geofence search warrants. Um, and well, so, I, I think it's also a store of information that is quite appealing to attackers as well. Yeah. And it would be scandalous if it got out. I think Apple's kind of moved the needle on a lot of this thinking, like with the way that they're doing their end-to-end -end encrypted, um, uh, you know, iCloud backups and stuff. And, you know, I was on a briefing call with them about that. And really, you know, the thinking is, well, breaches happen. 
one of the day, one day it could be us, right? We can't, you know, if we're in a position where we can't really guarantee that this data isn't going to get walked, we need to change our thinking, change our model, right? So I think that's, um, it's great that Google's done that. I don't think it's just about not wanting to serve up geofence warrants. I think it's, it's just, it's a bigger concept, which is just keeping all of this stuff is a liability. We used to say that data is the new oil. You know, you remember when that was the big thing, collect as much as possible. I think now people are realizing, and I, I can't remember who coined this, but they're saying it's not the new oil, it's the new uranium. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and storing it is is risky. So, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of um, smartphones, I think it's probably doesn't make any difference, this ruling, but like Kerr says, uh, possibly but vast if it, implications. If makes, yeah, yeah. yeah. If it makes all database searches... Um, unconstitutional that might be an issue all right tom we're going to wrap it up there um, you've written about a whole bunch of other stuff in the shorts section of the newsletter once again people can go to news.risky.biz and uh, subscribe but mate thank you very much for this conversation i always enjoy it and i'll look forward to doing it uh, again next week thanks patrick